The scripture reading for today is Luke chapter 16, verse 27 to 31. The scripture reading for today is Luke chapter 16, verse 27 to 31. He answered, Then, I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house. For I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abram replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abram, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Before we get into our lesson, I just want to express my appreciation for uh, uh, the men that serve on our mission committee and all the work that they've done preparing for this special mission Sunday. I think it's been especially encouraging uh, over the past several weeks uh, on Sunday morning to see our missionaries, uh, to actually hear them, and in some cases uh, to have the English subtitle to help us understand them. But, uh, but, you know, it, it's, it's, they've done a lot of, our, our, our missionary committee here has done a lot of work. They've visited uh, some of these places uh, over the past couple of years. There's a lot that goes in uh, to the work that's being done here. And so I, I just, I've found it really encouraging to, uh, to actually be able to hear them uh, this morning, lead us in prayer, read scripture over the past couple of weeks, just to, to, to be a part of our service and the guys in the booth back there do a great job. That's always nerve-wracking when something freezes up on you, you know. I thought about the people watching from home every once in a while, just stop and see what happens, and they figure we froze up. But um, look, look, on your outline, I've put down, you know, the Bible is a book of what's, but it's also a book of why's. Uh, I, I don't know what kind of kid you were. Uh, I didn't need to know why. If somebody told me to do something, I did it. I, I was pretty good at just doing what I was told to do. Uh, not, not everybody's like that. Sometimes people want to know why. And I think as we read God's Word, uh, obviously, uh, we know what He wants us to do. Sometimes understanding why uh, He's asking us to do things helps to motivate us to be more faithful in, in carrying out His commands. Uh, this is, I think, the 16th Mission Sunday that I've been a part of in my ministry here at North MacArthur. Uh, there are obviously great commission passages that, that come to mind. Most of us know what Jesus said uh, in passages like Mark 16 and verse 15. We're to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. How cool was it to be here uh, last Sunday night? And, and Jim, Jim Foltz has been a part of our mission program here for years. And he used the PowerPoint, had a, had a map of the world, and then you started to see arrows popping up, all, all these various mission points all over the world. Well, the money that you give today helps to fulfill this, this command to go into all the world, uh, to preach the gospel to every creature. Uh, Matthew uh, 28, 19 is another familiar passage. We're, 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 we're going and making disciples of all the nations. We're preaching the gospel to every creature. We're going into every nation. And, and that's, that's the commission. That's the command. That's the charge. Uh, John, uh, in his gospel, has a little different statement. Matthew and Mark sound similar. Uh, but in John 20, and verse 21, Jesus said, As the Father has sent me, I also send you. We, we understand that God sent his Son. And in, again, in John's gospel, in John 3, 16 and 17, we, we know that he didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. And, and now he's saying to the disciples, as, as the Father sent me, now I send you. 
And uh, on my outline, I underline that word send. It's an interesting, uh, the word itself is an interesting, the, the fact that we find it in, the, in another context, it seems unusual, right? Uh, the word in the Greek is pempo, and, and you see it here in John 20. You also find it in the story that BK was just reading to us about the rich man and Lazarus. Here's, here's a man who, who dies, and he discovers that he is eternally lost. He is in a place of torment. And he sees Abraham, he sees Lazarus, and he, and he, makes, he makes this request. It's Luke chapter 16, uh, I think it's verse 27. He's begging. The, the father there, he's, he's talking to Abraham. I, I beg you, Father, send him. Send, send Lazarus to my father's house. I've got five brothers. He, he doesn't want them to come to this terrible place. Could, could, you, could you imagine the urgency? Could, could you try to consider for a moment this morning the intensity? I've got, I've got five brothers in my father's house. I don't want them to come here. Could you send Lazarus? That's the word. Can you, can you lift the intensity of that context and, and listen again as, as Jesus says, the Father sent me. I'm sending you. What's the urgency? What, what are we supposed to be doing? We're supposed to be sharing the Gospel with the whole world. We're supposed to, we're supposed to be urgently telling others about life in Christ. Why are we supposed to do that? Because souls of men are in danger. They, they also can end up where that rich man is in the story Jesus told in Luke 16. And we've got to get there in time. Somebody said the gospel's only good news if it gets there on time. There's a great urgency. We're talking about being a soul winning church. I don't know in, in the way that God measures things if there's any other kind of church. How, how, could you, how could you be the church that belongs, that is uniquely in relationship with Jesus Christ and not be a soul winning church? Well, we're a church that feeds the hungry. We're, we're a church that serves the poor. We're a church that helps deal with the illiteracy issues in, in our city. We're a church... That, li, listen, there are all kinds of things that churches have gotten into. And, and in the midst of getting in to all kinds of good, reasonable, kind, benevolent things, they've gotten out of the most urgent thing. Folks, we need to be a soul-winning church. We need to be, I've got a friend that Bob Turner used to teach at Bear Valley, he wears a little pin that says, think souls. That's the problem with a lot of people. They think money, they think pleasure, they think body, physical health, they think about entertainment, we need, to, we need to think about souls. Being a soul-winning church is important because man is a living soul. You've got the creation account in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. God said, let us make man in our own image, in, in, according to our likeness. In, in what sense are we created in the image of God? You suppose God is bald? I'm looking at you, Dale, using me as a Bible class illustration this morning. We're not created in the image of God in the physical sense, in the, in the sense we have eyes that see, ears that, that hear, you, you know what I'm saying, a mouth that can speak, hands, feet, arms. That, that's not the sense in which we're made in the image of God. We're made in the spiritual image of God. The American Standard Version uh, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7 says, The Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And it says here, man became a living soul. That, that's what you are. You, you are a living soul. You, you, you are not just 
a body with a soul. Listen, the emphasis is on you are a soul with a body. The, the, the part that's going to last isn't the body. The part of you that is really you is not the outward man, it's the inner man. Someone said that we are not physical people having a spiritual experience. We're spiritual people having a temporary physical experience that will not last. We are spiritual people. That distinction is made frequently in Scripture, and we're going to look at three or four passages, uh, Solomon and Jesus and and, and Paul and Peter, and, and what they said about that distinction between the body and the soul. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 7, the dust returns to the earth as it was, the Spirit returns to God who gave it. There's a distinction. There are parts of you. Yes, you are physical, but you're also spiritual. That, that physical part of you is going to return to the, to the dust. That spiritual part is going to return to God. I can remember Avon Malone quoting this all the time. Some of you might recognize uh, Longfellow's quote, Life is real, life is earnest, the grave is not its goal. Uh, From dust thou art to dust returnest was not written of the soul. That idea coming from the the, the dust and returning to the dust, that, that wasn't written about the soul. That was written about the body, and so we see that distinction. Jesus makes the same distinction when he says to his disciples, don't fear fear those who kill the body but but can't kill the soul. Don't be afraid of those people. They, They may be able to destroy your body. They can't harm your soul. When Jesus says to the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. Where was his body? His his spirit, his soul, went to be with Jesus, but his body was was right there where, where, where he left it, hanging dead on a Roman cross. Did did Jesus keep his word to that man when he said, today you'll be with me in paradise? Did that man maybe think, I'm getting off the cross. I'm getting out of this execution. He's going to rescue me. That's not what he was talking about. He wasn't talking about today you in that body will be with me. He was saying you, that inner man that lives in the body, when, when, when a man dies, his spirit separates from his body. The body stayed on the cross, but that man went to be with Jesus in paradise. The soul of that man. You're a living soul. Your soul is out going to live your body. Your, your soul is what's most important to you, and it's what's most important to God. We see this as, as Paul is writing to the Philippians. He's, he's conflicted. Listen, he had, he had suffered so much. He was just ready to be with Christ. But, but he understood that to stay, uh, to, to keep on living, right, meant fruitful labor. What's he talk about? He, he talks about remaining in the body or departing to be with Christ. What does that mean? It, it means that, that his soul could either stay in his body and he could continue to live here and work and minister and, and serve, or if he, if, if he would die, and, and he calls this better by far, his, his soul would depart and be with Christ. What's he saying? He's saying, I can live in this body, but if this body dies, I, I can go live with Christ. But my body is a distinct and different part it's separate from my soul he's writing to the corinthians this is his second letter and he's talking about being called up into the third heaven this man has a vision that we all think paul's talking about himself but but he says i know a man well we think it was paul the the part of this i want you to think about isn't the vision or who had the vision 
He says, I don't know if this man, when, when he went up into the third heaven, and he has this vision, I don't know if he was in the body or if he was out of the body. I, I don't know. God knows, I don't know. The person that you are, the living soul that you are, can live in the body. And then when you die, can live apart from the body. Isn't that what Peter says? Is, is he's talking about teaching. And he thinks it's good. Even, even though you know all of these things, sometimes you think, you know, uh, Tim, you preached that sermon before. Well, you're probably right. I probably have preached some sermons here before. You know what Peter said about that? It's good for me to do that, to repeat these things over and over again. It's good for you. What? Well, that's not really the point. I, I want to slide that in there just so you know it's all right if I do that. But what, what the point I'm trying to make is he says, while I'm in the tent of this body, what's he talking about the body? How does he describe it? It's a tabernacle. It's a tent. It's a temporary dwelling place. He said, hey, look, I'm going to put off, I'm going to put this tent off. I'm going to put this tabernacle off. I'm going to put it aside. He's just talking about death. He's saying as long as I'm alive, these are the things I'm going to do while I'm in the tent of this body. But, you know, at some point I'm going to put this tent, this tabernacle, this shell that my body, that my soul dwells in, I'm going to put that aside. And you look at all of that, and, and whether it's Solomon and, uh, in Ecclesiastes or you know, what Jesus says in Matthew, you've got uh, Peter here and, and Paul, they're saying you are a living soul, and, and your spirit or your soul can maintain its existence in the body or apart from the body, that the body is just temporary. It's a, it's a temporary dwelling place. It's not the soul's permanent home. But I wanted to start here because I want you to know that it's important for us to be a soul-winning church because this is the part of man that I believe is God's greatest concern. I, I know that we get that mixed up, and I already made reference to that uh, earlier this morning. We, we, we are so easily distracted we, we, we focus on the physical things that are temporary instead of the spiritual things that are eternal. Paul in 2 Corinthians 4.16 will talk about though the outward man is wasting away, the inward man is being renewed day by day. It's the inward man that we're talking about today. The physical part of man is going to perish, but man's soul is eternal. And, and that's why we need to be a soul-winning church. Man, man is a living soul, and man's soul is eternal. Jesus is talking about this in Matthew 25 and verse 46. When he, when he talks about remember he's separating uh, the sheep from the goats, the, the righteous from the wicked, and, and, he, and he says, these will go away into everlasting punishment but the righteous into eternal life. I don't know why people who translate Scripture, that the ones who translated this passage, decided to use two different English words. In the original language, the Greek word is the same. The word that is used to describe the duration of punishment is the same word that Jesus used to describe the duration of life. How long will hell last? It will last as long as heaven. How long will heaven last? Well, we say that it is eternal. It is everlasting. Whatever we say about the quality of the duration of life, Jesus said the same thing about the quality and the duration of as far as how long it lasts, and, and whether we're conscious for it or not, the, the word used to describe one is applied to the other. 
eternity, just thinking about eternity, will, that, that will mess a little bit with your mind. We're not, good, we're not good with forever. You ever take a car trip with kids? They think it's going to take forever. They don't have any idea what forever is. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. M- most of us, when you say, well, if you take 10,000 Whatever you start with and you remove 10,000, you're going to have, you're going to have 10,000 less than what you started with. But when you subtract 10,000 years from eternity, do you know what you have left? You have eternity. I've, I've used these illustrations before. I think of all, all the illustrations that I've, that I've heard about, about eternity trying to to describe eternity, I, 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 like, I like the idea uh, of an ant that is walking across the equator. If you could imagine, uh, it, it, it takes the route, the same route, over and over again until it starts to create a path, and that path gets deeper and it becomes a trench, and, and the trench gets deeper until the two halves of the world fall apart. Now, how long would that take? doesn't matter how long it would take. It's not eternity. Eternity is forever. Somebody talks about one of these great cargo ships and it's, it's filled with little green peas and you, you, you sail around the earth. You, you, you make a full circle and you throw out one little green pea. And you go again, you throw out a second. How long would it take? You're going around and around and around until you get down and you look down we're down to the last one and we're going to throw out the last little green pea how long would that take to circle the earth until you until you got through a a cargo ship filled with those little peas it's not eternity it's not eternity We're not, we're not eternal in the sense that God is eternal. Because if you had a line with an arrow pointing in either direction, I, I think we could say from vanishing point to vanishing point, God has always existed. He'll always exist. Our, our lives are eternal in the sense that they had a beginning point on one end of the line, but that arrow that never ends on on the other side. When you were born, you became a living soul. And you will always exist. And we need to be a soul-winning church because the choices that people make in this life determine where they're going to live and what they will experience in the eternity that awaits after death. The third reason we need to be a soul-winning church, we said man is a living soul. Man's soul is eternal. The most valuable thing about you, it's so undervalued by the standards of the world. But your soul is precious. Your soul is valuable. I prayed about this the other day. And, and I don't, I'm not saying this to violate, you know, praying to be seen by men, but, but I just want to share this example with you. Sometimes we look at our children, and, and I, I want to be a dad that prays for my children. And we want them to be happy. And we want them uh, to be healthy. We, we, we might want them to be intelligent, to succeed academically. Want them to be athletic. Want them to be popular. Want them to be successful. And in, in, in prayer, 
God, if I can't have all those other things that I want for my children, I, I pray that we never lose track of the most important thing. That they're saved by the blood of Jesus. You can be attractive and lost. You can be healthy and lost. You can be rich and lost. You can be popular and lost. You can be well-educated and lost. The most important responsibility that I have to my children is to their souls. Your soul is valuable. You start to think about how we, how we determine value. I, I don't know. Tawny brought this home. I kind of liked it. I don't know what she paid for it. But, but a lot of times we determine value by what we're willing to pay. And so whatever the price tag was, she, she must have thought it was worth it. Because here I am wearing it this morning. I, I told her I get a lot more compliments now that she's picking things out for me. I used to dress myself. Um, people noticed. Uh, Value is determined by what you're willing to pay. Well, a couple weeks ago, uh, I was talking to Sheila. Uh, Sheila Hartman agreed to start teaching our ladies' Bible class. She said, I want this book uh, by Cassandra Martin. There it is. And we didn't know how hard it was going to be to get this book. It's out of print. We got about 16 of them. And I, I think maybe $15 a piece. And we cannot find any more of these books except Amazon has this one, you know, if you want to pay $757.43, and they were generous enough to say, hey, we've got a couple of used, lightly used copies laying around here you can have for about $300. And we decided that three books that would generally cost us $45, probably $1,350 was too much. We, we decided it wasn't worth that. We weren't willing to pay that price. God tells us what we're worth. You need to hear this. I, I think there are people who don't feel like they're worth very much. It's 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, and I use this passage. This is one of my favorite verses. I, I love this passage. It's not with silver and gold that you've been redeemed from your empty way of life, not perishable things like silver and gold. That's not how you were redeemed. Bought back. God wants you. He wants to be in relationship with you. Sin separates man from God, but he wants you back, and he was willing, and he, and he was willing to pay a price. What did, he, what did it cost him? It's not with perishable things like silver and gold that you've been redeemed from your empty way of life handed down to you by your forefathers, but by the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without spot or defect. The soul is a precious thing. You're worth the, the life of the Son of God. You know, I'm terrible about this. If somebody's preaching and said, repeat after me, I don't want to do it, so I'm not going to make you do it. But I tell you what I'd like, I'd like everybody to just say out loud, and maybe you'll do this on your way home. I am worth the life of the Son of God. Some of you need to say that to yourself. That's how much God loves me. Your soul is more valuable than the whole world. J Jesus said, what, what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? And, and I want you to kind of see a picture here, if you will. If you had one soul and, and you put that on the balance, on the scales, and you put the, you put the whole world on the other side and and just think about all, all of the things that that would include. If you guys will help me out in advance, the, the slide for me. We're talking about wealth. We're talking about pleasure, power, 
uh, prestige, popularity. And, and you know what the Bible is saying? Well, when Jesus says, what, it, what does it profit a man? He gains the whole world and yet forfeits his soul. What will you give in exchange for your soul? There isn't anything in this world that, that is worth your soul. You know what? Your soul is greater. Look at it. It's greater than the world. He you guys advance for me? Look at that. You know what's funny about that? I don't make my PowerPoint. I, I put in what I want and the program makes it for me. It comes up with the design. I love it. It kept putting the earth over here on the left, and it kept putting the soul over there on the. And I, and I would I would drag it. I, I would grab the picture and drag it, and then refresh. And it kept switching and switching. And and and, and I was talking to Jeremy about it, and Jeremy said it's almost like the world has programmed us to think that way. It's almost like the world has programmed us with its messaging to believe that the world is more important than the soul. But it's not. Your soul is greater. That living soul that dwells within you is greater than the whole world. I think this is why we exist is to be a soul-winning church. Jimmy Allen said, God loves every soul in the world more than you love your mother or father, your, your husband or your wife, your sons and daughters. Some, sometimes I read things like that and I'm a little bit startled. God loves every soul more than I love my parents, more than I love my wife, more, more than I love my... God loves every soul more than you love the person you love the most and He wants us to see souls to value souls the way he does. I was talking about this lesson Austin Greer called, talking about Mission Sunday and the plans for this morning's lesson, and he, and he made this comment. He wasn't trying to help me with the sermon, but it did help me. He, he spent a year here, maybe a little less than a year with us, and when he went away, he said, here's, here's what I noticed. This was the difference. You, you notice the difference right away when you leave North MacArthur because every member there knows it's part of their job. Isn't that interesting? That one of the things that he carried away from his experience as a one-year intern was every member of this congregation knows it's their job to help win the lost. If that's true, I hope it will always be true. And I hope that will never change. I want to invite you to do some things this morning. I know most of you have already walked in and, and we're not you know, taking up a collection after the fact, but I want to invite you to give. Uh, give as much as you can to support our missionaries. I want to invite you to pray. Remember them as often as possible in your prayers. I want to invite you to encourage, whether that's through social media, uh, emails, handwritten cards that you send, be an encourager to our missionaries. Let them know that you're thinking about them and, and praying for them. I, I want to encourage you to share the gospel. Don't just support the sharing of the gospel, share the gospel. Don't just give money so others can do it, you be involved. I want to invite people this morning who have not come to Christ to make the most important decision you're ever going to make. To repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. You are a living soul. Your soul is eternal. Your soul is valuable. The salvation of your soul, it's the most, it's the most important decision you will ever make and some of you have an important decision to make right now I hope you'll come to Jesus as we stand and sing